Good evening and Merry Christmas. I'm Michelle Dunaway. Over the past year, we've taken you on a journey across Northern Michigan in our segment Northern Michigan in Focus. Over the next hour, we will take a look back at some of our favorite people and places. We'll start in the middle of Thunder Bay with a gentleman who has a unique hobby. Then we'll see what the guys from Stand Up for Great Lakes is up to next. I have a great job. I, I absolutely love the Great Lakes and uh, love sharing them with people. It's Friday night, January 27th, 2017. Superintendent of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, Jeff Gray, is at work greeting guests at their annual Thunder Bay International Film Festival in Alpena. Very much like a national park. We're here to protect these incredible resources, but also ensure that the public can get access to them, educate people about them, and, and show people different ways to enjoy them. But it's how he enjoys them in the winter that may surprise you. Started paddle boarding uh, several years ago, and uh, I have a friend that's a Great Lakes surfer, and so I saw him out in the winter time. So then I said, you know what? I'll start paddle boarding more in the late fall, early spring. And then it turned into paddle boarding in the winter time. With paddleboard in hand, Jeff hops into Thunder Bay and explores the lake he helps protect. The Great Lakes are beautiful four seasons around, and try to stretch that out and find little windows in. When it's not completely frozen, we're going to get out and spend some time on the water. Some may think, what if he falls, or how could he take that cold weather? And one of the first things he does is jump in on purpose. What I do the first time every season is I go out very shallow. I go underwater. I see what it's like to be underwater because it, it is, you need to be safe. This isn't something just to go try and make sure that you can take the cold, get back on the board, and, and get back to shorts. It's often the, the walk home or the walk in the car is the, the, the tough part. Now before you call him crazy, there is a method behind this madness. My surfer friend told me that, you know, because they're out there in the crazy weather, and he said, there's not bad weather, just bad gear. So having the right gear is, is the right, right thing. I'm in a pretty heavy-duty wetsuit, and it's, it's cold, and it can be windy, but it it's, can be absolutely beautiful. Um, just a week or so we were out and the water was crystal clear. It was like looking through a gla glass, seeing fish and rocks and over the, some of the shipwrecks. It's just, just spectacular. Spectacular is right. Another thing I've really enjoyed is the, the sunrises and sunsets. Um, something about the winter, sunrise and sunset is extra, so spectacular. So trying to get out early and it's just, just phenomenal. The, this side of the state is a spectacular place and being on the water is the best way to enjoy it. I'm Jeff Gray, superintendent of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and in that role I kind of oversee all the operations of the sanctuary, from our research and resource protection to our education uh, to the operation of the building we're in right now, the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center. If you ever get to meet Jeff Gray of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, you'll quickly find he has a deep passion for the Great Lakes. Oh, I love it. I think it's great. You know, I, what we do here as a team working with the community is trying to preserve and protect the Great Lakes and their rich history. And what you're about to see is him taking that passion the extra mile. We're doing a little special event today as a fundraiser. We're, we're supported with um, the Friends of the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary really help us with our education programs and the staff for education. And as an incentive for that, if we raised a certain amount of money, uh, I would dress up in a turkey costume and jump in the Thunder Bay River. And unfortunately for me today, it's about 25 degrees out there. <laughs> They raise the money. And on a cold, windy day in Alpena, the tomfoolery begins. This is a foul deal, right? <laughs> Butterball. With a flap of his wings, the turkey's in the oven. Or the freezing cold river. We can't not show you that again. But this time, let's do it in slow motion. Back on shore. Turkeys can't swim. So you can still donate at uh, thunderbayfriends.org. Thunderbayfriends.org. Support our mission to protect the Great Lakes and their rich history. Gobble, gobble. Gobble, gobble. Thanks, everybody. Now that's passion, folks.
There goes that turkey running to the hot shower. For Northern Michigan in Focus, I'm Corey Adkins. Think of those high winds and then you think of the ice building up on those vessels, snow squalls, visibility reduced. Lake Superior in November, known for its fury, its brutality to those who set sail during its gales. You've got the lakes are still warm at that point, but you've got these low pressure systems and you have often that cold and that warm coming together and it creates these dramatic gales and storms. We just had probably one of my favorite paddles I've ever done in my life. I mean, on the anniversary of one of the most famous shipwrecks. I mean, we paddled at sunset, 22 degrees, sunset, lighthouse, and excited for the big news to come. And big news they have. You may remember the guys from Stand Up for Great Lakes, Quinn Morris, Jeff Guy, and Joe Lorenz. These guys put their bodies to the test. They don't talk. They stand up for what they believe in, and they do. In 2015, they paddled 60 miles across Lake Michigan. This past summer, they did more than 90 across Lake Huron, all to raise awareness for Great Lakes issues. And now in 2018... And we're planning on crossing Lake Superior in middle of July. We're just talking about routes right now, and we're doing it for the Shipwreck Society. So, <laughs> huge news. <laughs> Important to the Shipwreck Society is the ongoing research and exploration of the hundreds of wrecks, the thousands of lives lost, and all the stories that are so important to the history and future of this lake. It goes to the core of what we do as an organization, and they're becoming a part of that now. Well, I think, one for me, one of the most important things we can do at the Shipwreck Museum, and really any museum, is to properly remember those people that came before us. On November 10th, 2017, 42 years to the day the Edmund Fitzgerald sank, taking 29 men with it, Quinn, Jeff, and Joe stand up for their memory. And beyond that, they stand up for all the issues, and they stand up for the stories that lie beneath the waters of Lake Superior. It's real fitting, and um, I think it really sets the tone of the importance, the significance to a lot of people. It meant a lot to a lot of people. These uh, gentlemen from Stand Up for Great Lakes are gonna be crossing Lake Superior uh, and at the same time raising awareness of uh, not only what we do at the Shipwreck Society, but also that very uh, delicate nature of the Great Lakes and uh, helping to preserve the water that we all love around us. Next, we introduce you to three different guys, all with very interesting stories. There are so many unique and interesting stories across northern Michigan. In this segment, we tell three very different stories about three different folks. Oh, we have a lot of fun. There's a place down Arlington Street in Sault Ste. Marie that served the community for over 45 years. There's no name on the window, but you'll know it by the original barber pole. It still works. But sometimes when you walk inside, you don't know what you're going to get. 44 years. Haven't given a good haircut yet. Lex Walsh was looking for a job more than four decades ago after the Poe Lock was built. And it came to an end, so this place was available, so I just came in and bought it. Right there, the jokes began. Never did pay the guy, but I still, you know, I'm still. <laughs> this here, this is, this is hair out of a guy's ear. His humor helped him build his client base. And maybe some are a little needy. I tried to quit on a number of times. They come down to the house and get me and bring me back. I even went and picked him up once this winter. I think I need a haircut. Well, he says, how am I going to get in there? I said, I'll come pick you up. With a joke? They've always liked it well enough to pay me. Sometimes you get the door open and they're gone. <laughs> After joke. He cut mine with a bowl for years. <laughs> <laughs> These guys will give it right back to him. They come in, they get an oil change. I don't have to come back, I get the, and then I come back in 30 days, I get another oil change. Of course, I don't know why he charges me so much. <laughs> so much more to Lex and these guys than a place to get a haircut. We, that's, we look forward to sitting down and shooting the breeze. I always have a good time and always a good joke, good laugh. I think that's what most people come in for is the, the conversation and that sort of thing because it isn't uh, all serious, it's all fun to sit there and listen to them, you know, that sort of thing, and get in the conversation. 
Yeah, he's uh, been here quite a few years, all right. No question about that. Speaking of a few years, let's get back to that barber pole. There's a, a plunger on the top of it. But <laughs> we've kept it going for all these years. I had, I had to waterproof it, so I put the plunger on it. <laughs> the toilet plunger. It worked like a charm. It, it was like it, it was manufactured for that. Lex, well, he's looking at 83 on his next birthday, but he's still having just as much fun as he was 44 years ago. If he wasn't doing this, he'd miss uh, just talking to the people. No, no question about that. I think I have more fun than any one person deserves. With Chief Photojournalist Corey Atkins for Northern Michigan in Focus, I'm Michelle Dunaway. Line up right, right, right along here. Go about, about to this line, you guys. When Dan Hall enters a school, song follows. 115, time for specials. But this isn't a simple music class. These students are writing original pieces, learning, and working together as a team. I come into the school on a, on a Monday, and I don't even know what the songs are going to be about. The, the teachers and students pick topics based on what the kids are learning. Dan Hall's Story Song Creations takes him to dozens of schools across the state, working with thousands of students. This week it was K through 6 at Charlevoix Elementary. The sixth graders were taking on science through song. Adam, find another atom to make a molecule. We listed all the words like atoms, we listed molecules, we listed water, liquid, gas, all that kind of stuff. All the words pertaining to what they're working on. And then what we need is that very first line. And so uh, I said, well, you know, what happens when atoms come together? We all helped for the first part, a lonely little atom, and we just kept going on from that. We'll go to school another day. Dan tries to work with students to craft one line an hour per class, so every class gets their say, and in the end, the grade has their own song. Patrick added his two cents. Fast precipitation, slow evaporation. Slow evaporation, fast precipitation. And bit by bit, things come together. Scientific terms combined with real world situations helps them to really apply it, and using that other creative part lets them take that curriculum knowledge and really put it to work for them. Dan started this venture in 1989 after spending a day with his own boys. It was raining outside and they wanted to write a song, so we wrote a song called Rough, 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 It's Rough Being a Dog. And I thought, man, this is cool. And I like the way their little minds think, you know. Kids' minds are pure and they function in a way that we forget sometimes as adults. So I thought, could I pull this off with a whole school full of kids? Yes, he can. And I've written and recorded more than 500 songs with over 250,000 kids. And schools have come to embrace him. It's been fun to have him in the building. He comes in and brings a smile to everyone's face. We had our entire staff singing this morning, which was a really fun way to start our day. This is the last day of his visit here, when the students actually record the songs they've written. It's nice to watch them transition from being I don't know what's going on here, but now I'm helping to write a song to all of a sudden now they're recording artists. Helping students make melodies and memories, a job that's never really a job for this music man. I want to do this for as long as I'm on this earth. It's a, sort of a gift. Dan Fischel is a familiar face around town. He moved to Roscommon 43 years ago. I came up here from Missouri to run the newspaper in 1974, and then in 1990 I ran for village president. That's when he noticed an eyesore, something he was determined to change. Yeah, this is where I first started in 1990, and uh, for some reason people cut across here and they, were, they threw their cigarette butts down, and uh, it was just a, just a mess. I mean, so I just came up with the idea of digging that up and putting flowers in. So I didn't know how it would be received, so I did it in the dark. <laughs> it was just from the lights from the post office. It turns out Dan's sneaky plan worked. No, I started uh, planting the flowers along the streets. And back then you could buy a flat of flowers for three fifty-four dollars and, uh, and so there were, there were other people that would, would donate money. And that small seed of an idea has blossomed into much more than the nearly 20 beautiful flower beds around town. My thinking is that 
people will get off the expressway here for gasoline or something and, and, or food, and if they see the flowers, they'll know it's a safe place, it's a welcoming place, and uh, maybe they'll want to come back. And I actually had, there was a couple that helped us one year. They bought a house up here because of the flowers. They helped us plant. And, and they bought a house where they said those flowers were so beautiful and they thought this was a good place to live. A labor of love bringing people together. I think people are attracted to beautiful things and, and unusual things. I think our town's unusual. I think these flower beds make it. As for the future of the Ross Common Flower Committee. I'm not going to live forever. <laughs> and, I, and I'm hoping that that uh, we get more and more younger people involved. For Northern Michigan In Focus, I'm Courtney Hunter. Coming up, meet some four-legged friends. Welcome back to our Northern Michigan In Focus Revisited. It seems animals have a way to get into all of our hearts. Now you'll meet some baby reindeer and a camel that celebrated a 10th birthday. Then we'll introduce you to two sisters who have a very unique way to make money. This is the best time of year right now. This is even better than Christmas. What yeah. could be better than Christmas on a reindeer farm? A baby boom. It's calving season at the rooftop landing reindeer farm in Clare. Very healthy calves so far this year, so that makes us happy. Um, five is a pretty good crop for us. Years and years ago, we used to have 12 or 15 born every year, but we don't keep a herd anywhere near that size now. So we're very happy with, uh, with four or five uh, calves each year. While it doesn't get much cuter than this, it's a whole lot of work for Dave Aldrich and the rest of his team. First of all, they're always born in the morning, usually right around sunrise. We try to be with them when they're born, so I'm out here every, every morning at 5 o'clock waiting for babies. And as soon as they're born, I'm with them and I bond with them at that point. Uh, the first couple of hours of their life is the most important time to bond with a baby. And that bonding continues almost constantly during the beginning of their lives, desensitizing the animals to humans. And I'm with them every couple of hours for the first few days. So we don't get a whole lot of sleep, but you know, we'll rotate people, but uh, somebody's with them every couple, three hours, spending time with them, so they're used to us. And then they start start working every day, and uh, it's a it's a process. It takes a couple of hundred hours before they're completely trained, and we know what they're going to do. I bring those two out every day. So. And this training is so important because these little ones will be on the job before they know it. Every day they have to learn something, because it won't be too long, and they'll be traveling around, and they'll be visiting schools and libraries and doing Christmas parades and such. So we get them ready for uh, any situation that's going to come along in their lifetime. So they're very comfortable around humans. Mom's right there. Look at. Mom's right there. They're already starting to get it at just 24 hours old. But one thing these babies don't have yet: names. We're going to have five babies that we're going to need to name. It needs to be something somewhat original. We don't want to reuse uh, Santa's reindeer names. So if anybody has some ideas for us, we'd love to hear them. And if you think Dave's worried about another famous four-legged baby stealing the spotlight, think again. And the good thing about reindeer, of course, is they can fly. And seldom see one of those giraffes flying. So For Northern Michigan In Focus, I'm Michelle Dunaway. So it's his 10th birthday. Every year we throw a birthday party for him. And... There's a lot of buzz at the Lewis Farms in New Era about a big party this weekend. Party? What party? Wait, who's having a party? I wanna go. I wanna go. And you wonder whose birthday it is. Huh? <laughs> Jeffrey's kind of the star of the farm. He's our dromedary camel. He's gonna be 10 years old this year. When you visit Lewis Farms, it's hard not to fall in love with Jeffrey at first sight. You gotta laugh though, because he doesn't even act like a camel. Basically, Jeffrey does not think he's a dromedary camel. He uh, he thinks he's a dog. So he just loves to be around people, and he loves loves the attention. And this weekend, he'll be getting a lot of attention when the farmyard turns into one big party. Happy birthday at two o'clock. The uh, Corn roll starts at 11, goes till 5.30. We got free face painting going on that day. We got live music. Um, we, our candy cannon will go off that day, which is basically a giant cannon. We shoot up in the air and we shoot 75 pounds of candy out over the crowd. You are a pig girl. Yes, you are. And yes, there's cake. He loves cake, so when you're coming out on Jeffrey's birthday that day at 2 o'clock, we're going to sing him happy birthday and give him cake, and everybody gets free cake that day. He absolutely loves frosting, so 
my wife makes sure he gets lots of frosting that day. And uh, he's kind of a pig when it comes to eating cake. A corn roast, cake, and a camel that thinks he's a dog. What could be better? I'm going to a party. I'm going to a party. I hope there's dancing. Happy birthday, Kissily. For Northern Michigan in Focus, I'm Courtney Hunter. Um, we're picking up poop. You might be thinking to yourself, what an odd way to start a story. I don't know, our dad just thought it would be a good idea for us to do. This story starts when the Hodges family from Traverse City was on the road downstate and saw a sign that gave them an idea. I do competitions. We actually started the business when we were driving down to my competition in Ipsilani. Madison. I like to sing. And Ava. I like to do gymnastics. These things cost money. And our dad just thought it would be a good idea to do this and get some money. So at ages 10 and 12, they started their own business. Yeah, our business is called Scat Squad. We came up with the name by brainstorming in the car. And got to work. It's a crappy job and someone's got to do it. The business model isn't rocket science. We drive to the house and go around the yard looking very carefully and we pick up the poop and dump it in the bucket. And in return they get... <laughs> it's not the most glamorous job. Our first one there was a lot of poop and that one took almost two hours. Does it gross you out at all? Uh-huh. Yeah. The last one we went to it was really gross. But that doesn't matter because this future singer and this future gymnast are learning that in order to reach your goals in life, you gotta earn it. Don't ask your mom, go out and earn some money. And pick up poop. Something we can all appreciate. This pays off and it's cool to earn our own money. So if you're in the Traverse City area and your yard needs help, go to scatsquad.com and it goes right to the Facebook page. We pick up where they left off. For Northern Michigan In Focus, I'm Kevin Essebaggers. Next, aircraft carriers on Lake Michigan and a touching tribute to our Vietnam veterans. Welcome back. Believe it or not, there were once aircraft carriers on Lake Michigan, then a touching tribute to our Vietnam veterans. And to tell you honestly, I would say 90% of the people that come here have no idea that aircraft carriers were on Lake Michigan. Yes, it's hard to believe, and almost a secret until now. Aircraft carriers ended up on the Great Lakes out of necessity during World War II. We have the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and our government is looking for a secret safe place to train pilots. And so a gentleman um, came up with the idea of Lake Michigan. The project moved forward with some very modified vessels. So they purchased two sidewheel steamer passenger ships. Um, the SS CNB and the SS Greater Buffalo. And they converted them literally into 550 foot long aircraft carriers by tearing off the top deck and putting on a, a wooden long deck for planes to land. What were once basically floating hotels became a training ground for fighter pilots. It was huge. They trained over 17,000 pilots that, that were then sent over to the European theater and, and went to war. And the qualifications were simple. You had to land six times and take off six times. If you could do that, you were done and you were off, off to Europe. Many died during that training, sometimes because these decks were much smaller than the ones used in war. Among those pilots who found their roots on Lake Michigan, a man who fought, returned, and will be forever remembered for his life of service. Former President George H.W. Bush was one of those training pilots that trained and out of a fluke we decided to send a letter to his presidential library not expecting anything in return and about three months later a letter came and he gave us a quote and so we have that quote in the exhibit as well so we're, we're pretty excited that he recognized our little little museum in Michigan um, and responded to that. He and the other pilots trained mostly near Chicago but the just recently declassified drone program brought the vessels north. And so they use the carrier to actually land the drones and take off and, and do some training with the drones. And then the drones were flown, flown north up towards the Wagashans Point Lighthouse. And the lighthouse had been decommissioned, if you will, 
and they were looking for a target in the middle of the water, and that became the target where they were dropping live bombs. But no one really knew what was happening here because no one talked about it. The United States was so afraid that Germany was going to invade us at some point that mum was the word. People didn't talk about anything to anybody, even the efforts that they did for the war. Thankfully, since then, some have shared their stories. You can find them and more about the aircraft carriers in Lake Michigan at the Grand Traverse Lighthouse Museum. It's a unique thing that happened in the fact that one of them came right into Grand Traverse Bay for a short period of time in August of 1943 is, is our claim to fame. The exhibit officially opens May 1st. For Northern Michigan In Focus, I'm Michelle Dunaway. It's good to look back and see what they did for our country. Shipped off like a package, lives forever in damage. Fought to ensure world liberty, came home with hostility. Battle worn, battle scarred, kept war away from the backyard. Fought for our nation with, our, with great pride. Weren't sure if they'd come home alive. There was always a struggle, but they never gave in. Wounds go deeper than just their skin. Fought in uniforms made of cotton, the ones who were lost will never be forgotten. This poem meant a lot to me when I was writing it. I can't put it into words. Veterans, they fight for us. They go through unimaginable things for us. They suffer physical and mental trauma for our freedom. They come back knowing the job was done. The demons of the job come back to haunt them. A bell that dings, reminding of what had to be done. Whether overseas, in the air, or on solid ground, they give their all, whether that be figuratively, literally, or mentally. Some come back with missing limbs. Some come back with missing fragments of their very conscience. Some come back with it all there, but the pain still stabs the ache of old wounds returning at any moment, the shadow of memory coming to strike when you least expect it. War is pain. They go through it all so we can breathe freely. Once we actually realize the sacrifices the soldiers have made and their families, it sort of connects you more and makes it more personal. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done, standing to fight for our nation because you are the heroes that stand in the background. We hail the police, the president, and the politicians for their clever thinking and their battle strategies. But the modest yet brave heroes are at play too, volunteering their lives to fight for what's best for our country. Even though the job is saddled with grief, you push through and survive, despite the fall of friends and possibly family, a constant reminder of relatives and companions back home. It takes courage, a kind of bravery only certain people can muster. We honor, do our best to understand what the tragedy of war is like, but we've never experienced it firsthand, like you have. I'd have no idea how much persistence and raw strength it takes, but I can still admire the determination to fight, to fight for the past paths our forefathers and mothers have staked, to fight for the today and the current generations, and to fight so the unborn have a tomorrow to look to. So on the behalf of America, thank you for your service. Coming up, a trip to Voyager Park in the Sioux. Then we head to the Straits of Mackinac for a ride on a pirate ship. Welcome back to our Northern Michigan In Focus special. Right now, we're going back to an island in the middle of the St. Mary's River that sat vacant for years. It is now a beautiful park. Then to the Straits of Mackinac for a trip on the pirate ship Good Fortune. This is Voyager Island Park. If you've never heard of it, you're not alone. Just two years ago, the island was run down, overgrown, and abandoned. And so basically, um, the trails had grown over. The people that lived here back in the 40s or 50s or whatever it was probably had all kinds of trails here, but we had a hard time finding them. It's an asset the city of Sault Ste. Marie has owned for decades, but could never really agree on what they should do with it. And it sat here for many years, and there were proposals through the years to do something with it, but they're very expensive. But Dennis Doherty and about 70 other volunteers could not stand to see the natural beauty of this little hidden island go to waste. We had volunteers that could come out and save tens of thousands of dollars in contract labor just by volunteering to cut the trails, build the dock systems, the toilet system, put in boardwalks, and we did free charge labor-wise. 
So all we had to do was raise money to buy material. Now it's on its way to becoming a must-see destination in northern Michigan. But if you want to explore this little piece of paradise, you'll have to paddle your way there. It wasn't just paddle boards, you know, canoe, um, kayak, or paddle board. And the reason um, is that we knew that people were getting more into sports like this. And, it, and I just thought, hey, this is kind of the right time to do it. You can grab a kayak or paddleboard rental on the mainland at Bird's Eye Outfitters. And once you get to the island, it's even equipped with special docks so everyone can enjoy this unique place. So whether you had bad knees or hips or whatever or handicapped in any way, you could get in by using side assist bars and overhang bars and get into your kayak. Pull it out. Yep. And the paddle there is only half the fun. Once you've reached Voyager Island, the possibilities are endless for voyaging visitors. Two or three weeks ago when I came onto the island, I looked down in the mud and I saw a big moose print. So um, we know there's animals, or deer are all over here, porcupines, fox. Wilderness trails, scenic overlooks, and even a little glimpse into the island's past, there's something new to see or learn around every corner. And so I think uh, if you're looking to get out and just do something in the summertime that uh, gets you out of the normal you know, routine, let's say, this is a unique experience to come here and walk the trails. And while this project is just beginning its voyage, we have Dennis and his army of volunteers to thank for this slice of pure Michigan perfection. Clearly, there's, it's been a labor of love, and it's really impressive, and I, I hope you get a lot of uh, people coming up here to take advantage of it. Absolutely. Come on board, you guys. The Black Rose. That's how everyone aboard the ship knows me. Weigh anchor and hoist the mizzen. It's time for adventure on the Straits of Mackinac aboard the pirate ship Good Fortune. I was thinking, ooh, maybe like we're going to get to like maybe see some cannons and see pirates and stuff. And the little lad Eli was right. But first, there was work to do. Just like in life, you start at the bottom, lads, and you work your way up. Guess what? You be me swabbies. You know what that means, me swabbies? Swab me, Jack! So the minute they get on and we start heading out, we keep it action-packed from the second we leave until when we come back. I'll be Jack Sparrow. You be Jack Sparrow? Well, how come I always got to be a sparrow on board? Imagine that. After swabbing the deck, these little pirates must protect their ship. Come on. Get that cannon moving! on, shoot them cannons! Press them buttons! Keep the Kraken away! I might say! Safe from the Kraken, the crew goes underneath the bridge for a sneak attack on Fort Michelamackinac. Firing the cannon in three, two, one! We got him! Wow, that's so cool! Um, what I liked about the cannon mostly is I liked how it shot out fire. But the cannon fire unleashed something from the bottom of the straits. Do you think it could be treasure, me loves? Do you see it over there? Should we go get it? So we pull it from the sea and we make them all sit down and make it very, very dramatic. Because it might be a booby trap. Then we open it. You see, all pirates on this ship have one. And you take this and you put it in your pocket, mate. And what it means the pirates will always protect you. Now I'm pretty sure I'm already thinking not afraid of pirates anymore. Because what does that coin mean? Means like it means that mean that means like if I have this coin, I'm a part of the pirate crew. And I'm their family. And a dance to celebrate. Now, does anybody like to spin in a circle? Ready, lad, give me your arm. Right there, hook me. Other side, ready. There we go. I don't have no arms, but you can dance with us. There you go. <laughs> doing that and doing that it was, it was really, really cool. I had a great time. I got two of you going at the same time, mate. And how could you end a pirate ship voyage without a sword fight? It's so great to see some of the reactions from some of the kids. I mean, honestly, to me, it's like I watch these kids, they come and run and jump in my arms and are like, thank you, you know, these, just these little tykes. Fun, I had a great time, unbelievable. For Northern Michigan In Focus, I'm Courtney Hunter. From a pirate ship, we move on to some lighthouses next, including one that may be haunted. 
What would the shorelines of our Great Lakes be without the lighthouses that dot them? In this segment, we take you to the most photographed lighthouse in Michigan, then across the state to one still occupied by a spirit who doesn't want to leave. Perfect beach day. That's what I call them. Perfect beach day. Howling winds, bitter cold, surrounded by ice. I wear spikes, I keep three or four underlayers on, I have an ice rescue suit, I have a survival suit. When no one else is at the shore, that's when you'll find Mark Lindsay and his camera. I am in my element when it's below zero and the winds are the highest. I really want to be covered with ice. I think you prepare yourself to shoot in conditions that you want to shoot in. Winter time is one of my favorite seasons and I love it when the waves are up. It's days like these that make for shots like this. For Mark, it's therapy. I chase the light, it chases me. Um, the shore has been a great healing place for me to come out and wander in the beauty. This journey all started with a walk. 2009, I was out hiking along the uh, Manistee River and I wanted to capture a couple of shots of what my eye was seeing. So he got a new camera. The first four months I overexposed a bunch of images. And joined the Traverse City Camera Club. I was a nervous photographer. I walked into my first camera club meeting as a guest and my knees were knocking. <laughs> it, it was, but it, it really has turned into something. Something spectacular. I typically shoot four feet lower or four feet higher and once I learned to get down and actually change my perspective with my camera and let my lens do the, the work as far as getting scale and perspective it shows you a complete other side of the beauty that most people will just walk across. Today much of Mark's joy comes from not only taking these photos but sharing them with others. The beauty that surrounds us also does include us and I think it's important to realize that just by getting out in it it does affect you and it does change you and it's changed many. From France to Saudi Arabia to Missouri he's bringing people to northern Michigan without them having to leave home. The healing with other people I mean terminal patients people that have they're missing something or they want to see something sometimes this is it it's all it takes. It's just a trip to the shoreline. And it's a trip he will continue to take, enduring the biting gales of winter, the frigid waters of Lake Michigan, sand covered in snow and ice, to make sure everyone can be part of this majestic place we call home. It's definitely a passion. It's something I'm chasing. I'll never stop. For Northern Michigan in Focus, I'm Michelle Dunaway. Point Betsy was built in order to mark the southern end of the Manitou Passage. It was 1854 when construction began. On October 20th, 1858, the Point Betsy Lighthouse was lit. At the time, other than the light, this was all undeveloped land and somebody had to take care of the lighthouse. One keeper and his family. Well, for those who were hired to be a light keeper here, uh, this was a uh, isolated, lonely place. And for 20 years, they were the only people right at this location. Then it was the age of schooners and some steel propelled ships. Some days, a hundred vessels would pass by here. And while the keeper was tending his light, I mean, the kids had fun. They loved to, of course, in the summertime, they all swam. They fished here regularly. Uh, in, when hunting season came, they were hunters. The lighthouse keepers took their jobs very seriously. Maintenance had to be done daily. And sometimes accidents can happen. He was a light keeper and he's on a ladder painting the tower. This poor fellow uh, fell from the ladder and uh, broke his legs. This is life at Point Betsy. In 1875, the lone lighthouse keeper got some company when the U.S. Life Saving Service moved in. In 1895, the actual lighthouse structure was added onto because second and third keepers were needed to help with the daily grind. They had to maintain the property. They had to keep the equipment in excellent condition. They had to 
uh, uh, do everything that was necessary. They had to raise, in many cases, raise food, catch fish, go hunting, do all the things that are necessary for survival. Between the lighthouse keepers, the life-saving service, and then later, the Coast Guard, many ships were guided from danger, and many lives saved. Now the lighthouse serves a new purpose, to serve you, the visitor. Well, I just think it's a beautiful place. Uh, there are many lighthouses. I am extraordinarily grateful for the support that we have had. It's a place to reflect. You know, it's been magical for a long, long time. It is often said, and I think reliably so, that this is one of the most photographed lighthouses in the United States. And simply take in life. I want him to say, that is a really special place. And it's amazing to me how many people do. For I absolutely adore it. <laughs> I've been here, you know, many summers, and I just can't stay away. <laughs> he keeps calling me back. <laughs> Come on, Sally. <laughs> Come on back and help us out here. The old Presque Isle Lighthouse, a beautiful light about 15 miles south of Roger City. It's a place where you can find peace and quiet, solitude and charm. It's a place that will draw you back. He loved it dearly, you know, here, both him and his wife, but he probably just couldn't get away from it. Wanted to come back and keep helping the ships come into the harbor here. George and Lorraine Paris were caretakers of the light from 1972 to 1992. George died in 92 from a heart attack. Some say he never left. Shortly after he died, his wife Lorraine was coming back from Aaron one night. She looked up at the lighthouse, it was getting dark out. She saw the lighthouse light come on and she's like, what is going on? How can I be seeing this light and there's no power? The power to the light had been cut for decades, so Lorraine kept the phenomenon to herself. But for three weeks, the light kept appearing. That's when she called the Coast Guard to make sure no one reconnected the power. Came back in the house and they said, Lorraine, we hate to tell you this, but there's no way a light can come on out there. What do you think's going on? She said, well, you know what? Has to be my husband, George. He's come back to tell me he's still watching over me. And to this day, people still see the light come on. I've seen it come on. Men on freighters, fishermen, all have seen the light that shouldn't be shining. You know, you know, they're telling the truth because fishermen and guys on the freighters aren't going to come in and tell me a story. <laughs> They'll tell me a true story. They saw the light. Even though this may seem a little spooky, it seems George has a gentle soul. One time, a little girl climbed the light tower by herself. And when she came back down... She was laughing and giggling when she came in the house door there. And her mom says, what's so funny? She says, well, I was talking to the lighthouse keeper out there in the lighthouse. And she said, there's no lighthouse keeper up there. And the little girl said, yes, she, yes, there is. Look up there. And there was this picture of George Paris on the mantle. So there he is. He's the one that made me laugh. <laughs> so Maybe the ghost of George Paris is all part of the beauty of the old Presque Isle lighthouse. He's a spirit who loved his wife, makes children laugh, and still will turn the light on to help guide mariners to safety. Yeah, nice ghost. Takes care of the boats when they come in when it's stormy weather, especially when it's stormy weather. The light will come on to help guide them into the bay here. Yeah, keep up the good work, George. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Michigan Asabo Valley Railroad. <laughs> Salt of the earth, folks. That's the best way to describe Howard and Joanne Schrader. Well, I've come here for 20 years. It's just fun. They've done a lot of work. It's very beautiful here. And for 20 years now, they've been creating memories for thousands at the Michigan Osabo Valley Railroad in Fairview. Yeah. Oh my God, look down there. <laughs> There's the ravine. Oh my, oh my, oh my, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> Years of smiles, laughter, and wonderment. Great day. Yes, it is. I love doing the color tour. Yes. I love just having a good time. It just makes your life so much better. But eventually, everyone comes to a crossroads in their life. It's gotten hard for Howard to keep up with the maintenance. And getting in and out of the engine wears on his body. So Howard and Joanne had to make a hard decision. And the thing is, it got to a point where this summer my daughter came up and she was 
talking to us and she says, you know, Dad, she said, Mom has had worked here for 20 summers and hasn't had one Saturday or Sunday off in the summer in 20 years. So that's what kind of hit me. And the thing is, she wanted to retire and I think it's time. We're both 73 and so it's time. I am ready and I think Howard has because I always told him I would not ever ask him to, to close this down until he was ready. And uh, after a couple of surgeries, knee surgeries, a hip surgery, and in our age, October 14th and 15th will, will be our last weekend to run our railroad. One more weekend and that'll be it. The hardest part of their decision is leaving the bonds. Call, this time of year I call silver fox time. Saying goodbye to the friendships that they've made over the past 20 years. That's who we are going to miss, are the families. We have seen families grow, you know, from infants and now they're young adults. The little ones especially, uh, the ones that get excited, even the big ones that get excited, the adults as well. And um, it's just the friendship that we have acquired through the years and so it, that's who we are going to miss. This weekend will be the last time you can experience the magic people have felt over the years. We made it! I think it's awesome. Awesome! One more time through the tunnel. Over the trestle bridge. Look at that bridge. Past the red underwear. Oh, look, they got their laundry out. And the old man and his dog. We hope you have a good trip and we'll see you later. Bye. Wow. The man and his dog. And sitting on the porch all day long just doing that. <laughs> One more weekend for smiles, laughter, and memories with Howard and Joanne before the train leaves the station forever. For Northern Michigan in Focus, I'm Corey Adkins. Thank you for taking a look back at the interesting people and places in our Northern Michigan in Focus segment. Over the past year, our 9 and 10 News drone fleet has flown high over Northern Michigan, taking some fantastic shots. We leave you with a look back. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us and have a very Merry Christmas.